let's just connect with God this morning. And uh, if you are a first time visitor, either watching online, let us know in person. Horizon donates $25 to Compassion International in your honor. Uh, and you can find out more about them or on at their website.
oddly enough, is for us to listen to God, to hear from God. Why? Because we'll have something interesting to say. We'll have something worth hearing when we hear from God. One God idea, as Mark Batterson used to uh, always quote in his books, endlessly, is better than a billion good ideas. Hearing from God is better than having the rapt attention of everyone on the planet. You could have a billion subscribers to your social media platforms, but hearing God speak is so much better than that. We all need to find our voice, the special way we've been wired to share hope and life with the world, the unique message that God wants to speak through our lives, that's our voice, but finding our voice always starts with hearing God's voice. The Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset said, tell me what you pay attention to, and I will tell you who you are. What do you pay attention to? Do we pay attention to the still small voice of God, or do we pay attention to other things? Most of the time we pay attention to other things, which is why I'm not hearing the voice of God. You will be shaped by the loudest voice in your life. We have to get quiet when we hear God's voice the loudest. If the loudest voice in your life is your voice, you will find your ego insecure, and you will find yourself prone to anxiety because there's no one outside of yourself to tell you that you are enough, that you matter, that you're worth it. You're constantly having to reassure yourself. Is God's voice the loudest voice in your life? Do you even hear his voice? That's the question for us today. If the answer is no or not often, that's a problem. For most of us, we go through our Christian lives just accepting that prayer is one direction, that it's a one-sided conversation. And so we show up and we say, hey, God, this is what I need. This is what's going on. And then we go about our day and we're like, well, I don't expect to hear from him anyway, so it's no problem that he's not responding. We don't stop to wait and listen because we're too busy or God speaks too infrequently or it simply requires too much energy to discern what he is trying to say. Genuine listening, waiting to hear from God, is ultimately an act of submission. It's saying God doesn't have to work on my timeline, I'm going to work on his. Listening is an act of love. Um, I'm a very impatient person. Extremely impatient. I know. Darby's so surprised back there, right? Sometimes Darby speaks a lot slower in her natural cadence than I do. I speak a lot faster. Um, in fact, one of my criticisms when I was taking um, preaching classes in seminary was you talk too fast, talk slower so people have time to like catch up. And I was like, people can hear faster than humans can actually speak. So if I speak faster, your brain gets left bored. And the seminary professor didn't like that. I've actually preached at other churches as a guest, and they said, hey, in the next service, you know, they had multiple services, could you just talk a little slower? No, this is the way I talk. Let's stop wasting time. Let's get out of here. Um, but a lot of times when I am impatient, when I am communicating to Darby, and she feels this is, you don't love me enough to slow down and listen to what I have to say. How often is that true in our relationship with God? So why is it so hard to hear God's voice? If he's talking, why is it so hard? I think there's multiple things. First one I want to talk about is that God whispers, he rarely shouts. In 1 Kings 19.12 it says, uh, God is showing up to Elijah the prophet, and in verse 12 it says, Yahweh was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake came a fire, but Yahweh was not in the fire, and after the fire came a still, small voice, and he spoke to Elijah. The biggest being in existence, God doesn't need to shout, he's not insecure, he doesn't have to flex by showing up in an earthquake or a whirlwind of fire, he whispers and he rarely shouts. What does a whisper do in a relationship? It makes you lean in, right, to hear um, sometimes I'll whisper to our daughter, and uh, I'll be able to whisper and I'll say, And so she naturally like gets closer because she wants to hear, and then what I do, I wrap her up because she got close enough for me to grab her. God often speaks loudest when we're quietest. Our world is designed to be noisy and to keep you busy so you do not hear the whisper of God. Hearing God means slowing down, sitting still, and listening for Him to speak. It means not only carving out time to bring him our requests, that's good, that's what prayer is, but to sit still and ask him for directions 
about how he responds to our requests and how he wants to fulfill his kingdom mission in us and through us in our day. I think another reason that it's so hard to hear God's voice is God speaks slowly and he doesn't rush. God has never worked on my timeline, not once. Not in my entire 40 years of life can I say, man, God did that exactly when I wanted him to. He always does it on his timeline, not on mine. He seems to have no respect for my ambitious drive, my anxious need to not waste time. I wasn't married to 30. My vision board put it a lot younger than that. I was supposed to get married a lot younger than 30. Um, we didn't become parents until almost 40, 10 years of marriage without children was not the plan. Uh, why doesn't God get online? I have the perfect plan laid out. I expected Horizon. Now, this is a little bit of my, uh, my pride and my arrogance here. When I first moved up here and I started Horizon, I wrote out this three-year plan for the church. It was like 100 people in three years. That did not happen. The, Alex's timeline is not God's timeline. God is patient, and I am so not patient. I am impatient in so many areas, especially in prayer. And if I am impatient in prayer, I will move on before he's even started speaking. Because I'm too busy doing things that I am to spend time with the one that I claim to be doing things for. How often do I miss the encouraging word I need because I do not linger in God's presence to hear him speak? How often do I miss the wisdom I need about what to do next? Because I'm too busy creating my future to stop and listen to God's advice about it. Amazon Prime, love it. I order something, many times it's one day shipping, smartphones in my pocket. Now when I have a question, I don't say, I should go look that up. I just pull out my phone and I go, yep, here's the answer. Microwaves, man, I make dinner so fast with a microwave or high speed internet. All those things have convinced me that good things come instantly. Good things come now. I don't have to wait. But I think the old adage is still true. The best things in life are things that we have to wait for. Wait on God. He does not rush to speak. But no one who hears God speak ever thinks that was a waste of time. I think another reason that we don't hear God's voice is because God says what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. Sometimes like children trying to ignore their parents' rebuke, we know God is going to say something we don't like, so we avoid him. You, you ever seen the kids do this, like, the parents giving some corrective instruction, and the kid's like, whoa, 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 I can't hear it, I can't hear it, I don't want to hear it, I don't want to hear it. There are some people who avoid church because they know they're going to hear something they don't want to hear. There's some people who avoid scripture for the same reason. There's some people who avoid sitting still and waiting for God to respond to their prayer because they don't want to hear from him because they know he's going to say what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. And so often what we want to hear least is what we need to hear the most. Break up with that person who's destructive and destroying your internal life. Stop looking at that thing that's bringing you no peace but only anxiety. Stop going to that thing that you think will only bring you solace, but only I can provide that. Stop finding your deepest source of identity apart from me. He doesn't say these things to be controlling. He says these things to set us free from things that will enslave us and never keep their promises to us. And there's another problem I see in churches about the voice of God. Sometimes we claim to hear from God when we don't. We say maybe a lot, or at least I do, because my no lacks courage. When someone asks me something, I want to really say, no, I'm not going to do that. But I say, maybe, because I don't have the courage to say no. And sometimes in churches, what we say is, I will pray about it. You ever had anybody say this? You know they're going to say no, but they say, I will pray about it. And lo and behold, they come back in a few days and they say, I prayed about it and God agrees with me. No, right? We say, I will pray about it so that later, with the weight of God behind us, we can say no. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't drag God's name into your decision when he really wasn't consulted and you didn't, really didn't wait for him to speak. There's a classic Homer Simpson line in the show The Simpsons when Homer says, Lord, if you want me to do this destructive thing, give me absolutely no sign. And he goes through this whole prayer. At the end, he's like, if you want me to eat this plate of cookies, give me absolutely no sign. And he goes, your will be done. And he eats the plate of cookies. And as ridiculous as that is, that is how a lot of people in churches determine what God wants them to do. They think about something they want to do, and they say, hey, God, if you don't want me to do this, just 
you know, burn down the house right now. What if he did? If he didn't strike me with lightning, I'm going to go ahead and do it. So often, what we want to do is roll more by our personal desires and leaves little room for God to speak slowly, to speak quietly, and to possibly speak against the direction you already wanted to go. I'm not sure we can always tell God's voice from our own desires. There's a lot of people who tell me, God told me to do this, and they go and do something, and I think, that took you so far away from God. That led to so many destructive things and hurt so many people. I just can't imagine that God told you to do that. I feel like you wanted to do that, and you blame God for your bad decision. See, it's easy to confuse what you want with what God wants when subconsciously you think you're God of your life. Some of us haven't heard God's voice in so long, so it is easy to be confused about what he sounds like. And that's why one of the things we need to do is, when you say, hey, God has told me something, run it past some of the New Testament scriptures about what God says and what Jesus is like. If somebody comes and tells me, and they're like, hey, God's giving me this mission to go out here and wipe out all these people, I'm like, that does not look like Jesus. That does not line up against scripture. Whatever God leads you to do, if you hear a voice and it doesn't line up with what Jesus sounds like, you're not hearing from God. You're hearing from yourself, you're hearing from someone else. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Samuel was a boy serving in the tabernacle, and um, it says in verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know Yahweh, the God of the Bible, the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. The word of Yahweh had not yet been revealed to him. And a third time Yahweh called to him. He's been sleeping at night and his voice has been calling to him. Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli, who was the priest there in the tabernacle. And he said, hey Eli, here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that Yahweh was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down in your bed. If he calls you again, say, speak master or Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went away. And lay down in his place. And Yahweh came and stood there, calling us at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. How often is God speaking and we mistake his voice for someone else's? Each week in this series we have homework because prayer is not a theological idea. It's a spiritual practice. It's something we do. It is too easy to listen to a message about prayer to be like, man, that was, that was good. Or that makes sense for someone with a concussion, but, you know, we need to make it something that we act on, that we live out. Your homework for this week is simply, after you pray this week, spend at least five minutes sitting still and quiet and simply say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak, for your servant is listening. I'm going to be listening to these quiet minutes. I'm going to be listening throughout my day for you to speak. I am listening for you today. I believe that God might already be speaking, and you might be missing what he was trying to say to you, because you are moving too fast. You are living too loud. You are refusing to slow down and listen intently for his voice. So stop and listen and invite him to speak. Mother Teresa, who served in the slums of India, helping the poorest of the poor and the sickest of the sick, was originally part of an Irish mission in India that was dedicated to educating Indian Christians in the Catholic tradition. And so she did very little work with uh, the poor or the sick or anything when she first went over. It was all about teaching them theology. And so they would bring in Indian Christians and they would teach them the Bible. And she was a tireless worker. They said that she was almost a workaholic. And she had worked herself to a point of exhaustion where her superiors said, hey, you need to take a break. You're going to get sick. You're working so hard, working so long hours, you never stop. So they sent her by train to the north of India to take a vacation, a holiday at the foothills of the Himalayas. On the train ride, forced to stop working and striving, she records that Jesus spoke to her, and he called her to abandon teaching and her work, and instead work in the slums of the city, dealing directly with the poorest of the poor, the sick, the dying, the beggars, and the street children. This is what she says that Jesus spoke to her in the train. This is what he says. She says, he says, come, come, carry me into the trenches of the poor, he told her. Come be my light. Be my fire of love among the poor, the sick, the dying, and the little children. 
And that conversation on the train changed her entire life. A conversation with God, we usually do that. It happened because she had a change of pace, she had a change of place, and it positioned her for God to give her a change in her perspective. She got quiet and slowed down, and she heard God speak. Near the end of her life, um, some letters were released after she died, where she lamented in some of these letters that it had been decades since she had seen God spoke, speak as clearly or as plainly to her as he did on that train. She's like, I didn't have a lot of encounters like that that I had on the train. I wish I had had more of those. She longed to have an experience like that again, but the vividness of that encounter was still carrying her forward. She's like, Jesus didn't meet with me again like that, like he did on that train, but she said, I kept following his marching orders that he gave me on that train. People who have heard God speak don't claim it happens audibly very often, if ever, but he does respond to our prayers. He does speak if we watch and if we listen, if we get quiet and if we move slowly. Now, I know this can all feel very abstract, so I thought it would be helpful to reflect on how Richard Foster, who I quoted at the beginning of the message, practices listening for God in his daily life. He says, the key to hear God speak is through your routine activities to discern the divine word in daily ventures. Foster says he desires to know God's voice in the daily junctions of his everyday life, to learn his vocabulary through ordinary tasks. And you say, well, Alex, that sounds great. What does that look like? Here's a few days from his journal where he writes about how he heard from God. Just listen, <clears throat> Just listen to the different ways that God speaks. On a Tuesday, he writes, I think the heavenly voice spoke through my emotions today. Feelings of loneliness and of being shut out by others really rattled me. But I believe I've heard two things from God in the midst of these emotions. First, the feeling of self-pity shows how far I still have to come in the walk of faith. And second, Jesus pointed me to lonely, hurting people around me and invited me to care for them because I now understood how they felt. A Sunday, he writes this, My mind was engaged in a thousand different things today. Listening to God was so hard because inwardly I seemed so fragmented. Then suddenly, all at once, I became aware of the silent of creation all around me. I saw trees and grass and sky as if for the first time, and I heard God. He said one word in my mind, and the word was peace. On a Monday, he writes this, What a lesson I had in listening today. I had a meeting in a nearby city at noon, but left at 10 because I had several things to get done and do, and the tasks were finished much more quickly than I expected, and by 11, I was ready for the meeting, but first I was angry that I had a whole hour to waste. And then I stopped and tried to listen to see what the Father would want me to do. And I felt this tug to go to the church where the meeting was going to be held and to find, I guess, a vacant room to study. Instead, when I got there, I found the pastor was desperate and alone and desperately needed to talk to someone. So he proceeded to pour out his fears and his hurts. It was a wonderful time and well worth the investment of an hour. But I would have missed this precious experience if I had not been listening for God's on a Tuesday, he writes this, is there any connection between attentiveness to the divine voice and the flow of creative thoughts? All morning, there was such a rush of fresh new thoughts that I barely had time to record them all. Is this because I've been listening for God? On a Friday, he writes, I was at the beach today with Carolyn, my wife, for rest and recreation of our marriage. I felt the need to be away from my experiment of listening to God in everything. I wondered if I'm straining too hard after God and in the very act losing what I'm seeking. Tired, um, I tried just to enjoy the wind and the sun without getting any message out of it. And suddenly I felt the sense of God nodding in approval at my decision. On a Wednesday he writes, the discipline of listening to God is still outside of me and something I must work at by the act of the will. How strange it seems like work, how much like work it seems to listen. How far we have fallen from the days of Eden. But it is easier than when I first started this experiment. On a Tuesday, and this is a little bit of a long story, so I'll just summarize it. But he has a small child, Nathan, who's a toddler and is getting up at 5.30 a.m. And is making his mornings uh, very difficult. I really related with this paragraph. You know? And he says, um, when I was up very early with him one morning, I went into the living room and sought to center myself into the light and light of Jesus. 
and I felt like God said this to me in my mind. I want to teach you my patience. Too easy you get angry. Too easy you're out of tune with my way. You think you have a reason for your anger and frustration, and so you do. But I want to transform your inward spirit so totally that you will be full of peace and patience, even when you have every human right to be frustrated and angry. This is what it means for my words to be in you. When you are at peace, you are in tune with me, and then you will be able to pray for your children with spiritual success. After expressing my thanks for this word about bringing my life in line with his truth, I prayed for my son Nathan, and he fell into a deep sleep and slept in until 7 a.m. that morning. So I continued to listen, and later in that day, my wife, Carolyn, had this message, which I think came from God. I think we should let the children stay up an extra half hour at night, so maybe we'll sleep in some. It was so simple and so wise, yet this little word of advice stood out from all the other words that I heard that day as a message from God delivered through one of his people. It is strange, this sense of one sentence standing out from all the others as if it was spoken in italics or in bold. On a Thursday, he said this, I am finding that listening works much better when I am engaged in mission. Rather like missiles whose guidance systems only work after they are launched, sometimes I only hear God speak when I've reached out to obey. I could read many, many more entries from his journal, but I wanted to just give you a few about the different ways that God speaks. Did you notice the different ways that he speaks? What are some of the ways? What? Sorry. Through emotions. Through emotions? Yep. What? How else? Stillness. Through stillness? Yep. What else? Sometimes he brings a word to your mind. Sometimes you sense a nod of approval from God. Sometimes you hear God speak through your spouse or someone else through a stream of creative ideas, finding eyes to see what was always all around you. I believe when we go looking for God to speak, we will find his voice everywhere because God is everywhere. Or as Jesus would say, knock and you will find that the door will fly open. Ask and you will find that you will be given more than you've asked for. Seek and you will always find more than you expect. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful that you speak to us. And so often, God, I do not hear you. And that is not because of a lack of speaking on your part. That's because of a lack of listening on my part. I would like you to speak on my terms, on my timeline, in a way that is easy and comfortable for me to understand that I don't have to work at. God, forgive me for so often thinking so little of hearing from you that I'm not willing to work for it. When we have relationships we care about, we work at them because we care about them. And God, give me a deep passion to want to hear your voice. Give everyone listening here and listening online a deep de desire to hear from you and be willing to work at it until it becomes natural. Richard Foster said the longer he practiced listening, the easier it became. It's hard for us because we haven't practiced it.